In the headquarters of the United States and Russian Joint Control Commission in Korea, there was a meeting soon after the victory over Japan of officers of the two occupying forces. Japanese troops north of the 38th parallel had surrendered to Russia, while south of the parallel, the Japanese had surrendered to the Americans. The atmosphere was deceptively friendly, considering what was going to happen later in Korea. The United States considered the dividing line along the 38th parallel to be only a temporary military convenience, but the Russians had other ideas. After the Japanese surrender, American and Russian soldiers in the area near the parallel could be seen for a short time behaving like buddies. This sort of thing didn't last long because the Russian command was about to turn the dividing line into a part of the Iron Curtain. Two years of effort proved that agreement with Russia on Korea was impossible. In 1947, the United States referred the whole problem to the United Nations. The response to the American action was that the General Assembly established a commission to supervise free elections in all of Korea. But the Russians had no intention of allowing such free elections in North Korea. In South Korea, the people turned out in great numbers when the elections were held in 1948. While Russia was setting up a communist regime in North Korea, these South Koreans were forming a constitutional republic and choosing a president. To this government, the United States soon turned over control of our occupied zone. American forces then began their withdrawal. By the middle of 1949, all had moved out except limited numbers for advice and observation. This meant that the Republic of Korea was going to have only a small army and a native constabulary. Forces sufficient to keep order, but not to defend South Korea against military aggression on a large scale. When the Soviet began this aggression by proxy, they didn't look for any active intervention by the United States or other nations. That was the Reds' big mistake. By the middle of 1950, the North Koreans had a fully trained and equipped army. The Russians had seen to that. The day came when it was revealed what had all along been the communist plan, the invasion and seizure of South Korea. The invasion got underway on the morning of Sunday, June 25th, 1950. When they crossed the 38th parallel, the communist forces brought along artillery and tanks that had been supplied months before by the Russians. They began the invasion with eight infantry divisions, three border constabulary brigades, and an armored brigade. The South Koreans fought back for a couple of days, and then their resistance collapsed. When the Soviet began this aggression by proxy, they didn't look for any active intervention by the United States or other nations. That was the Reds' big mistake. From Washington, two days after the invasion began, came President Truman's order that American air and sea forces were to go to the help of South Korea. Aircraft of the United States Far East Air Forces were sent at once to operational bases. The conflict had hardly begun before our aircraft turned to the big job of keeping the South Koreans from being overrun and crushed at the very outset of hostilities. The North Korean troops were advancing almost unopposed, so our aircraft went to work on them. At first, we put a lot of emphasis on ground support of the badly outnumbered defenders. Within a few days, our F-80s were also going after the enemy's lines of supply we had to slow up his logistics if we were going to keep the South Koreans from being driven off their peninsula. The F-51s, too, went to work on interdiction targets, as well as doing their share in the close support of ground troops. In fact, all of our aircraft gave a fine demonstration of the versatility of air forces. The thing we had to do was trade space for time and slow up the invading forces enough to allow a buildup of defensive strength. So we went on, hitting anything that was carrying or storing communist supplies. By now, less than a week after the war started, 
our airstrikes went well north of the 38th parallel. communists had figured on having smoothly operating supply lines. We took out a lot of the smoothness, and we conducted these operations without effective opposition in the air, because as a first order of priority, our aircraft had destroyed the small but vicious North Korean Air Force. Eventually, 15 other countries sent ground troops to Korea. But from the beginning, by far the largest share of the military burden was borne by the United States. The 24th Division troops were immediately sent to the battle line, not as a unit, but by the plane load. This was an emergency. The enemy had to be slowed up. Even without any support from the air, the North Koreans were a formidable force, well-equipped and by far outnumbering the defenders. Piecemeal, the men of the 24th went up into the crumbling line. The enemy had a lot of firepower. They were a strong force, and the most our ground troops could hope for was a delaying action. Our troops needed close support from the air, and from the beginning, the F-80s and our other aircraft of all types supplied it. It was the only thing that prevented immediate disaster. Still, they came on, those North Koreans with their Russian-built tanks. For our people, there was only one thing to do, pull back, wait for a buildup, and turn a big part of the immediate operation over to our air forces. At best, it was going to be tough to keep a foothold on the peninsula. So, our air forces became the only effective offensive weapon we had in this early phase of the war. For weeks, the chief emphasis was on close support of ground forces. Even the B-29s shared in this job, a new one for these big bombers. The rules had to be forgotten if the North Korean army was to be held at all. The versatility of air forces was proved as never before. When the war was about a month old, we could divert the B-29s and other aircraft to more interdiction raids to keep the enemy's supply routes under attack. By this time, we were beginning to take care of the limited number of strategic targets in North Korea. We were doing a good job in slowing up the enemy's progress southward by destroying today the supplies he had counted on using tomorrow. But it remained true for about six weeks that a major part of our air effort was still in close support. Our B-29s included two strategic air command wings that left the United States soon after the conflict began and were flying combat missions only nine days later, adding their bombing strength to that of our Far East Air Forces. There had been thorough mobility planning for just such an emergency. In mid-August 1950, a month and a half after the invasion began, the famous Pusan perimeter was established. The big withdrawal was over. This far and no farther. The UN ground troops began digging in. The enemy had come far and fast, but now he was running out of steam and was soon going to find things a lot tougher. During the defense of the perimeter, the F-51s had a large share in carrying on with close support and thereby keeping the communists pinned down. The enemy drive had been halted, but there were still North Koreans out there in the hills, and we gave them no rest. It was one of the jobs of our versatile air forces to wipe out machine gun nests that in a normal war would have been targets for mortars. Interdiction was stepped up. We staged about 150 such strikes every day and smashed nearly 90% of the supplies the enemy was trying to bring up. His routes were so extended that we had plenty of targets. 
This was our chance to soften up the whole communist war effort while our ground forces were building up inside the perimeter. The first phase of the war was over. Thanks largely to our air effort, the United Nations was still in there fighting. It was a peculiar war, but the problems were not proving too much for the United States Air Force. The GI delivered his own kind of reprisal in bullets that could not be vetoed in the heavy guns of U.N. naval forces brought quickly to Korean waters, in the roar of American fighting planes dominating the sky. to the headquarters of the United Nations at Lake Success, news first came of the unprovoked assault upon the Republic of Korea, reprisals followed swiftly. Reprisals not merely in words, but in the courageous resistance of United Nations forces, fighting stubbornly for every yard, for every village. The GI delivered his own kind of reprisal, in bullets that could not be vetoed, in the heavy guns of UN naval forces brought quickly to Korean waters in the roar of American fighting planes dominating the skies. Yet our men, as representatives of the United Nations, utilizing devices such as this giant airborne loudspeaker, neglected no opportunity to bring to the ears of the North Koreans the true story of their communist masters and the determined opposition of the free nations of the world. Broadcasting from an Air Force plane high in the sky, the voice of the UN offered the individual enemy fair and humane treatment under the rules of prisoners of war. Answering this offer, a few of the enemy surrendered, but for our own infantrymen in the front lines, it remained always a grim war waged in a rugged terrain, slugging it out 24 hours a day, yard for yard. To these men, harassed by enemy fire, there was no sight more welcome and no sound sweeter than the roar of American planes flashing across the sky. The ground soldiers should and must have constant close support from the air. It is the mission of the Tactical Air Command of the United States Air Force to see that he gets it. To achieve this in the Korean conflict, Military leaders had gone into action in a matter of minutes following the outbreak of hostilities, mapping out plans for the optimum use of tactical air power in the battle ahead. Decisions were made on the spot. Requirements and operations determined quickly in cooperation with the surface forces. To airfields destroyed by enemy action or through the necessity of sudden retreat, to runways pocked with bomb craters, engineers went to work immediately. Fighters operating from Japan were shifted to within easy range of the fighting front. And in short order, our squadrons of American jets were roaring off the runways to perform the first job of tactical air, namely to challenge enemy planes in the skies and secure and maintain air superiority. Fighters of the tactical air team, when unmolested by aerial opposition, turn their full attention to close cooperation with and support to the surface forces in taking and holding aggressor territory. Moving in at the behest of such tactical considerations, our fighters take as their targets supply depots, troop billets, warehouses, bridges, tanks, ships, in short, any target of opportunity or any pre-assigned target of military significance.
certain jets, unarmed but equipped with high-powered cameras, serve as reconnaissance planes and return daily from photographic missions far into enemy territory. These intelligence photos, invaluable for disclosing the disposition of enemy strength, are hurried to the lab and processed immediately for the next briefing. Here is photo murals that are used by the briefing officer to outline a mission for B-26 tactical bombers. Primary targets are railway centers, roads and bridges, supply depots and other key installations. The B-26 is a standard light attack bomber of versatile use. It carries a bomb load of 5,000 pounds and is capable of mounting more than eight machine guns and 14 rockets. Since our forces maintain control of the air over Korea, the tactical bombers operate freely in their assigned task of isolating the immediate battle area and restricting the movement of enemy troops and supplies. Dropping down to closer range, the B-26s come into straight enemy targets with rockets and machine guns. constant harassing of the enemy is this, and the severe constriction of his mobility are important factors in all military operations, both offensive and defensive. As for example, in opening the way and keeping it open for large-scale paratroop movements. The task of transporting these men and keeping them supplied is likewise a function of the tactical air arm. Destined for a drop area deep within enemy territory, these men, carefully selected and carefully trained, deserve all the help that can be given them on their dangerous assignment. It's the job of the tactical air arm not only to get them to the right place at the right moment, but to furnish them constant and close aerial support during their operations on the ground. such as these are operating in enemy territory, it is doubly imperative that the advance of our frontline elements be maintained on schedule so that a juncture with the paratroopers can be achieved. At the spearhead of the attack and of a supply line reaching far to the rear, men of the infantry and artillery maintain their day and night attacks against the enemy. giving close and welcome support to the surface forces in the attack are the ever-present Air Force and Navy fighters and light bombers operating on tactical air missions. 
working on radio call and with on-the-spot instructions from air spotters with the advance elements, the planes are directed to targets immediately in the path of our advancing forces. As the tactical air command sees it, it's the ground troops who carry the ball, and it's the Air Force that does a portion of the blocking that opens the way for them. ground soldiers should and must have protection and tactical aid from the air. And in the present Korean conflict, he is getting just that, as completely and as skillfully as the tactical air forces can make it. Wherever there's a battle area to isolate, an enemy depot to destroy, a troop concentration to attack, even a single well-placed machine gun nest to eliminate, air force planes are flying on call to deliver the punch. Napalm, with rockets, with bombs and machine guns, the planes of tactical air are bringing to the ground forces the music they like to hear, the music they deserve to hear, thunder from the skies. 